Good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. We're going to try and study uh, verses 32 through 41 this morning. Acts chapter 13, verses 32 through 41. Uh, we've been enjoying uh, Paul's gospel presentation. We get a picture into what he used to preach as he would travel from synagogue to synagogue and speak to the Jews about the coming of their Messiah. Um, Paul had been sent by the church in Antioch. Um, he traveled with Barnabas across the island of Cyprus, and now he's gone up to a different Antioch, uh, Antioch in Pisidia in mainland Turkey, modern-day Turkey, um, and he's given permission there to stand in a synagogue and speak this gospel message. So far, uh, his message has been so gentle, so loving. Uh, he finds common ground with them right away. Uh, he speaks to them as brothers, as fellow Jews. Uh, the first week he, he, that we studied this, in the beginning of his message, we saw that he lays this foundation of God's character as God worked in the history of Israel. Last week, we saw him really lay out the facts of the gospel. Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ rose, and then he appeared to all the apostles. Well, now he's going to challenge them. He's going to bring an appeal to his audience and invite them to believe this message. They know who God is, they know what he's like, and now they know the facts of what God has done in their days, and Paul is going to invite them to believe this and receive forgiveness of their sins. As he does, uh, we're going to see four gifts of God in Paul's message today. Four gifts of God. God gave careful promises. He gave resurrection life. He gives freeing forgiveness. And he gave clear warnings. Four gifts of God. And the first one, I'll let you know, uh, he is, he's speaking to men in a synagogue who know the scriptures, and he's going to get a little technical, uh, and we're going to step through that together and, and try and be uh, careful together as we study those promises. But four gifts of God, the careful promises, uh, resurrection life, freeing forgiveness, and clear warning. So follow along. I'm going to read the text, the whole text, and then I'll pray, and we can jump in together. Uh, Acts 13, verses 32 through 41. Paul says in the synagogue, he says, and we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to our children by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you cannot be freed from the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. Pray with me. Father, we pray that you would help us. Uh, help us understand, as Paul quotes the Old Testament, as he proves the resurrection uh, to the synagogue, as he explains that the resurrection was in accordance with the scriptures. Help us see, help us understand, help us see uh, why he chooses these passages to build their confidence that this was something expected and wonderful and something that they can believe in and receive forgiveness of their sins. Help us all in this room believe this message with all of our hearts that Christ died for the forgiveness of sins, that Christ was raised. Help us believe it. Help us be confident. Help us trust you as we remember the promises that you've made to all believers. 
that your promises are, are true. They're careful. You meant what you said. And we can trust you. We pray for your help this morning as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first gift of God that we see in this passage is careful promises. Careful promises. And what I mean by that is, is exactly what I just said, that God was careful when he made the promise, that he didn't make a mistake. He knew what he was doing. He prepared the people for this so that the people should be expecting what was to come. Look at verses 32 through 34. Paul says, and we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to our children by raising Jesus. And some of your translations have uh, fulfilled to us, their children. But I think it's a little better to say our children. So this he has fulfilled to our children by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. So last week we saw that Paul explained to them that Jesus died in accordance with the scriptures. That Jesus' death was not a surprise to the Lord. This is something that the Lord spoke about beforehand and knew about beforehand and revealed to his people. And his death was in accordance with the scriptures. This week, we'll see that he was also raised in accordance with the scriptures. This was also always part of the plan. Uh, There wasn't a surprise. There wasn't a plan B. The Lord was careful as he promised these things. Uh, In fact, there are a few things that Paul, in our passage today, is going to point to the Old Testament to explain. One of those things is the resurrection. But there are some other things as well. And first, I think that what Paul is doing is he's setting out to show that it is expected that these Old Testament promises are going to be fulfilled in a future generation. It is expected that the Old Testament promises to the fathers are going to be fulfilled for a future generation. I think that he's addressing the issue of maybe what the, the, the men in the synagogue would have been thinking. You know, why is this okay for Paul to be speaking this way. If, if, Paul, if, if the Lord gave these promises to the fathers, if it was to the fathers that God spoke about this son of David who was coming, then why is it okay to assume that all of these promises were, were coming true in their day? You know, for them, I think this would have felt like an embarrassment of, of good favor from the Lord, Right? That in their day, for their generation, it was to them that the Messiah was sent, that he died and was raised again. Why is that okay? I think that's what Paul is trying to, to show, is that it's more than it's, than it's just okay. It's that it was expected all the time. That these were promises, and the promises were going to come true, and they were going to come true for a future generation. Now, <clears throat> as we step through this, Uh, there's a way to read these first two texts as both of them speaking directly about the resurrection. And try not to to get lost here as we talk about this. There's a way to read these uh, that says something like, uh, well, when he's talking about the resurrection, so Paul means that when God says, you are my son, today I have begotten you, that God must be referring to the resurrection. That's when God begat Jesus. Today I have begotten you. And then the second Um, the second text, they would say, this also must directly refer to the resurrection because he says, uh, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. So that must be speaking about the resurrection, that that was prophesied to David uh, and these holy and sure blessings are given to Jesus. Uh, That's how I used to read both of these passages. Since he has already brought up the topic of resurrection, it must be that both of these are directly about the resurrection. But I think he's doing something a little bit different. Uh, I think he is going to get to the resurrection, a specific prophecy about the resurrection in the third text. Before he gets there, I think he's explaining what he said first in verses 32 and 33. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to our children 
by raising Jesus. So he's going to get to the resurrection in the third text, but I think first he's explaining how these promises work and that it's okay for them to apply to them and their children as they see these things fulfilled before their eyes. I think this is a better understanding of the first text about Christ being begotten because the Gospels are full of language that the Son had already come, right? The Son had already been given. Uh, We would say the Son has already been begotten when he came, when he was incarnated. Um, The second text, this is also a better understanding of the second text because if you look at that verse, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David, the you there, for some reason, translators still don't use the word y'all, Uh, which I really think they should, but but that's plural. Uh, It's plural in the Old Testament, and it's plural here as as Paul quotes it. So he can't be just directly saying that this was a prophecy about Christ, how the Messiah has the sure promises of David, because it's plural. That wouldn't make sense. He's saying something about the recipients of these promises that the Lord has given, that the Lord is giving y'all these promises. So, uh, if, if I lost you, let me try and say it succinctly. I think Paul is making a, a three-part claim to this synagogue. And the three-part claim is that God made promises to the fathers about Jesus. And that those promises, at least some of them, are being fulfilled in their generation. And that one of those promises that's being fulfilled in their generation is that Jesus would be raised from the dead. So God made promises to the Father that were fulfilled in their generation. And one of those promises is that Jesus was raised from the dead. I think that in support of those three claims, he's quoting three texts. The first two texts deal with his promises. The third text deals with the resurrection. So if you're up for it, I want to go on a little journey. Uh, You can just listen if you want, but I encourage you to flip along with us. And the first place we're going to go is is none of the texts that he quoted, but is 2 Samuel chapter 7, where we hear about the Davidic covenant. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7. You might remember this chapter. Uh, What has happened so far in this chapter is that David comes to the Lord. He wants to, uh, he offers to build the Lord's house. Do you remember this? Uh, Referring to the temple. Uh, At first the prophet tells him, yeah, sure, you know, that's great. Do all that's in your heart. But then the Lord reveals to him, no, Uh, That's not for David to do. And the Lord sends a message for David about how it's his immediate descendant, his son, who is going to build the temple. And he talks about Solomon. And at some point, he transitions to talk about all of David's sons. So look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. uh, Listen to verses 14 through 16. The Lord says about David's descendant, he says, I will be to him a father. And he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with a rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This is what we refer to as the Davidic covenant that there is this father-son relationship between the Lord and the sons of David. That yes, they're going to make a lot of wicked choices and he's going to discipline them uh, through other men. Um, But the Lord forever, your your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. So there is this forever father-son relationship, special relationship with the house of David. Well, now turn over to Psalm 2. That's the first text um, that Paul is going to quote in our passage. Psalm chapter 2, the second psalm. Again, what we see in this psalm is the Lord using this son language to talk about a descendant of David, this one who is to come this promise to the fathers. Um, the, the people in Paul's day would have understood this already. We have record that they understood this psalm already as a, uh, a prophecy about the Messiah, that this son is coming to rule and to reign and to reign with a rod of iron. And so look down at Psalm 2, verse 7. The psalmist writes, I will tell of the decree. 
The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's the part that Paul quotes. You can see similar language down in in verse 12, son language again. Verse 12, kiss the son. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Okay, so wrapped up in this Davidic covenant, wrapped up in these promises to the fathers, is that this son is coming, this descendant of David. uh, And the Lord will cause him to be victorious. And the Lord will cause David's throne and his descendants to be before him for all eternity. These are promises to the father, to the fathers, from the father to the fathers. One more stop. Let's turn to Isaiah 55. This is the second text that Paul quotes. And this is our last stop, I promise, before we turn back to our text. In Isaiah chapter 55, uh, this was our scripture reading this morning, and it's one of my favorite chapters. And um, it's such a comforting chapter as we remember the Lord's grace. Chapter 55, verse 1. The Lord says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. You see this invitation, this freedom. Come and accept this free gift from God. Well, what is it? Look at verse 3. Incline your ear. Come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you, that's plural, remember, I will make with y'all an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. So in Isaiah's day, as he's giving this prophecy and the Lord is speaking through him, the Lord is saying the invitation is open. You can come to the Lord. You can receive this grace and mercy. Just like I promised steadfast, sure love to David that will never fade away. Others are invited into that and they can enjoy God's promises. God has a dependable, steadfast love. Now, this prophecy to Isaiah is given 300 years after David. And yet the Lord still is pointing back to the promises he gave to the fathers, promises that he gave to David 300 years earlier and saying, you can get in on this. Uh, You can enjoy God's faithful, steadfast covenant love. You can enjoy these promises. With all of that, let's turn back to our text in Acts chapter 13 and see if we can figure out what he's saying. If you were to continue on in Isaiah 55 like we did, you know, God makes it clear that it's not just okay that these promises are being fulfilled to another generation. It is expected. You know, he, he says, my word will not pass away. Um, he makes it very clear that um, the Lord will abundantly pardon All of these things God's people are invited into. So back to our text in Acts chapter 13. Paul is making a a three-part claim that there were promises given to the fathers and that those promises can be fulfilled in and enjoyed by future generations of God's people. One of those promises we'll see in just a minute is about the resurrection. But I think first he's speaking in a technical way to those in the synagogue. And saying, this is how you are meant to understand the scriptures. That God is clear when he gives promises. And they are going to be fulfilled. And his word is going to stand. And his people are invited into the fruit and the blessings of those sure promises. And just like it was sure when he gave it to David. And just like it was sure whenever he uh, repeated it to the people 300 years later. It is sure because of what has happened by the, in the resurrection. Before we move on to the resurrection, let's just pause for just a moment to marvel at this, uh, to marvel at the Lord who was so careful in his promises. Uh, Many times we just read over these scriptures and and think that they can't be explained, think that uh, that can't be what God actually meant in the Old Testament, and then it just suddenly comes to pass in the New Testament. But that's never the scripture's attitude towards themselves. When the scriptures cite the scriptures, it's clearly that God knew what he was doing. He had a plan. He was very careful when he promised. 
Uh, he didn't have to suddenly come up with a plan B uh, because something didn't go right. And then he just said, this fulfilled what he had said before. No, God had given these careful promises to the fathers and they were coming to pass in their days. I think that's what Paul is celebrating with those in that synagogue. Well, if that's true about all of his promises in the Old Testament, well, then certainly that's true about all of his promises anywhere, right? In the New Testament as well. You know, when, when God promises that those who confess and come to him uh, receive forgiveness and he's faithful and just to forgive them, he meant it when he said it. There is not some plan B exception of, oh no, God didn't think about that sin. You know, he can't forgive that one. Or God didn't think about this person. He, that person sent too much. Okay, yes, for the most part, anyone who comes can be forgiven, but I forgot to mention this one kind of person. You know, that's never how God's word operates, right? He is so faithful to do exactly what he's written, and he was careful the first time he said it. If he didn't mean it, he wouldn't have said it. We can trust God's promise of forgiveness. We can trust God's promise that no temptation will overtake us that is not common to man. Have you thought about that one recently in the New Testament? It's humbling, right? Because we like to think of our situation of, of nobody's been through what we've been through. We like to think of ourselves as very special. You know, of course I send in this way, but if, if people only knew my situation, if people only knew my background, well, the promise from the Lord is he's not going to let anything come into our life that's not common to man. He's always going to provide a way to escape. Um, you are not a plan B. God did not forget about you when he made those promises. He is careful when he promises. And he meant what he said. Jesus was careful when he promised that the Father knows that we need food, we need drink, we need clothing, and we're not to be anxious. Instead, we can have the freedom to seek first his kingdom and understand that all those things will be added. Jesus was careful when he said that. He knew what he was saying. You know, I could go on and on and on. We could list any promise in the book, right? Uh, because that's how God's promises work, is that he is careful. He knew what he was saying. We can trust what he says. We don't fall through the cracks. I think that Paul is demonstrating this reality to them, that something was promised to the Father so they should expect it to be fulfilled. This shouldn't be a surprise to them about the resurrection. And that's the second gift of God in our text, the resurrection, uh, resurrection life. Look at verse 35. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. Now, if we back up to verse 34, it says, as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. Now, if you just took out verse 34 and you just wrote it on a paper and carried it around with you, it really looks like he's saying um, that as for the fact he raised him from the dead, um, he has spoken in this way, I'll give you the holy sure and sure blessings of David. But I think what he's doing is he's adding these two things together. I think he's saying he's spoken in this way and that these promises are sure and they were going to be fulfilled. And one of those promises is this resurrection. And I think that's why he uses that word, therefore, at the beginning of 35. Uh, he puts it all together and says, therefore, he says also in another psalm. So this is what Paul has been leading towards as he's been trying to show that the resurrection is in accordance with the scriptures. This psalm, Psalm 16, that he quotes from, we're not going to turn to today. Uh, we've already dealt with this one in a technical sense uh, as well. If you remember, Paul quoted from this exact same psalm, Psalm 16. And if you remember when we studied it together, most of the psalm is, is uh, about David. It's David speaking about his situation. And in verse 10 of that psalm, he says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. And we'd understand that to be about David. David is saying, I know you're not going to abandon me. But then in the next half of the verse, he grounds that assurance in a statement about God's Holy One. He says, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. And both Peter and Paul in the book of Acts take that as a clear messianic prophecy about how the Messiah 
Even though he would die, he would not see corruption. His body would not see decay. We know it's not about David because his body did see decay. Peter says, you know, we know where his tomb is to this day. Instead, it's about the Holy One, the Messiah, the one who's coming. David knows that he's not going to be abandoned because the Messiah was raised. He was not abandoned, nor did he see corruption. And Paul explains this in verses 36 and 37. Look at verse 36. He says, For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. So Paul is saying David had this very special purpose in his life, and he served that purpose, and the Lord used him, and then he died. And he had every confidence that the Lord would not abandon him to Sheol. But all of us know that he did see decay. And so this verse could not have been about him. Instead, he was speaking about the Messiah. And Jesus, though he died, he wasn't abandoned to Sheol. And he wasn't even allowed to see decay. He was raised before this corruption would have taken place in his body. This is a text that speaks about the resurrection. Paul says to the synagogue, we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to our children by raising Jesus. Paul is saying God said this a long time ago, and we should expect that his promises will come true, and look, it has happened. The Messiah did come, the Holy One did die, and yet the Holy One did not see corruption. This is exactly what God promised, and it has been fulfilled in our day. Yes, this is an embarrassment of favor that God has shown them to think that as they think on their history and they read the scriptures, and for centuries they've read these scriptures, to think that now they've come true in their day, exactly what God has said. But Paul says, believe it. Believe this good news as he speaks to the synagogue. Believe that this has happened. If you do believe, then the gifts keep on coming. So if you have struggled through this first part of the sermon, as we deal with all of these technical quotations, well, the rest of it is is leaving behind this technical part. Now he is going to give them an earnest appeal to come to the Lord and find forgiveness of sins. And that's our third gift. So look at verse 38 and 39, this freeing forgiveness, this liberating forgiveness. Verse 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed or justified from everything from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Isn't that an astounding statement? Through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him, everyone who believes is justified from everything from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Paul is giving this heartfelt appeal to them. He calls them men, and he calls them brothers. He says, therefore, let it be known to you, men, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. God showed through the resurrection that Jesus was the one, that it's through him they can find forgiveness and they can be freed from the law of Moses. Now, you can expect, as Paul goes from synagogue to synagogue, that certainly in in every single synagogue, there's going to be those who are Pharisee-like in their understanding. And when they hear him say things like this, oh, I don't need to be justified, right? I, I keep the law of Moses. I'm good. You know, I don't need this message that Paul is saying. But also, certainly, there was a remnant. There were others who already knew this truth. That the law of Moses does not free us. As Paul speaks in this synagogue, there were those who who would have known this. The law of Moses does not justify. There are things that the law does does not free you from, doesn't free you from the guilt that you incur. The law was not given to find forgiveness. 
Uh, Instead, the Lord had already made it clear in his word before the law was ever given that righteousness comes through faith. That the saints believed God and it was counted to them as righteousness. Those who who had this understanding in Paul's day, they would have understood that the law is not laid down. This is a quote from uh, Timothy that Paul says. He says, the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient. The point of the law is to carry these consequences. Yes, to reveal God's character, but also functioning as a law to carry out these consequences for disobedience. Uh, They would have understood that even the sacrifices are like this, right? Uh, That it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. There's no true forgiveness through the sacrifices. After David sinned with Bathsheba, you might remember in Psalm 51, as as David is repenting about that, uh, his focus is not, I need to go do a sacrifice so I can be forgiven. In fact, he says the total opposite, right? He says he needs to have this broken heart before the Lord, this broken and contrite heart. Then he can go and worship later through the sacrifices and proclaim God's, God's name. The law of Moses did have provisions for the processes of how to become clean so that you can worship, how to have uh, this sin atoned for so that you can come and and worship the Lord and be cleansed by him. But there are things that the law of Moses could never free them from. There are things that the law of Moses could never justify them from. The faithful remnant would have known that all along they rely on God for forgiveness by faith not their, law, their own law-keeping. And so as Paul is speaking to this crowd, and he has proved to them that this death and resurrection was in accordance with the Scriptures, and he's saying this forgiveness is freely available to you, and it frees you from everything that the law of Moses could not free you from. I think there are some there who would have known right away that they needed this forgiveness that the law did not justify them. I don't know if you have ever been involved in a court case, like in a trial, maybe someone you know, or or maybe even you yourself have been sued or or have gone to the courts. But at the end, uh, there is a deep satisfaction to the final word in a court case. You know, everything has been heard. There's no more loose ends. There's no more witnesses that need to take the stand. There's no more waiting for a verdict on pins and needles because you don't know how it's going to be decided. No, there is a final verdict, and a trial is over, and everything is tied up, and there's no more waiting. When that happens, there is this deep satisfaction, especially if it's in your favor, if the decision is in your favor. There's no more waiting. Well, this is what happens when you come to Christ. And I think this is what Paul is offering those men in the synagogue that day. That we have a real guilt because of our sin. That if our trial in the heavens went on without any intervention, then we would rightly be declared guilty in almost every way. That we would rightly be condemned and found guilty. And the law of Moses only increased the trespass to use another phrase from the New Testament. But when we're in Christ, he is the one who has paid the penalty. He is the one who has suffered that condemnation on our behalf so that we are freed and justified. And that verdict is final and has been reached. That verdict of justified, freed, liberated. The court case is not happening anymore. The court case is over and the verdict has been reached and it's an eternal verdict and it's a verdict of freed, forgiven, innocent, declared innocent because of what Christ has done on the cross. All the loose ends are tied up. There's no more waiting. Everything has been presented and we have a clear record. The trial is over. Jesus has won. He has declared us innocent for those who have come to him. If you have never come to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, then you need this. Again, if the trial happened today, if you died and saw the Lord and that happened today, you would be found guilty because you are guilty. All of us have sinned before the Lord. 
There's only one way to wrap up this trial with a final, eternal verdict of innocent, of justified, cleared on every account. There's only one way for that verdict to be reached, and that is for you to repent of your sins, believe in Jesus Christ, come to him for the forgiveness of your sins because of what he's done on the cross. The moment that you do, that trial is settled for eternity. It's over. There's no more loose ends. Everything is tied up. The verdict has been reached for all of eternity. If you're a believer, then remember what Paul is preaching here, this forgiveness, this freedom that the law could never provide. If you're a believer, then you are not still on the hamster wheel trying to earn God's favor as you just go around and around and around, trying to earn salvation. All of that is over. The trial is over. The verdict has been reached. You have been forgiven of all of your faults for all of eternity. You have been liberated. So take joy and have confidence and spread that news. It is such good news. It's a gift of God. Well, the fourth gift of God is clear warnings. God gave clear warnings. And listen to what Paul says next. He says, verse 40, Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. So Paul is giving a warning to his audience, uh, but he's going to use the words of one of the prophets to give that warning. And a prophet is Habakkuk. We actually talked about this the very first time we studied this speech a couple weeks ago. Uh, so let's just remember what this quotation was from. Habakkuk um, comes to the Lord. Do you remember this in the book of Habakkuk? He comes to the Lord and he's pleading with the Lord because there is injustice in the land, the land of Israel, the land of Judah. And he comes to the Lord and, and, and is pleading with him to address this. Well, the Lord answers and the first part of his answer is exactly what Paul just quoted, saying that this is going to be hard to believe. This is hard to stomach. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. And then God goes on to tell Habakkuk what that work is in his day, is that he's bringing Babylon, the wicked nation of the Chaldeans, he's bringing them to come and discipline his people because of the injustice in the land and because of their idolatry. Well, Habakkuk has a really hard time with this, if you remember in the book. He goes back to the Lord and says, you're going to bring them, you know, this wicked nation? I know that this nation is wicked, but you're going to bring a, a, a nation that's even more wicked to discipline this? But by the end of it, Habakkuk does have faith. He accepts what the Lord says. And listen to what Habakkuk says at the end. One of the most beautiful parts in all of Scripture. He says, I hear... And my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound and rottenness enters my bones. My legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. You can see Habakkuk's amazing faith in that moment. Yes, this message brings rottenness to my bones. I don't like to hear that this nation is coming to discipline our nation. And yet, I know that God is good. I know I can trust him. I know I can wait on him. Well, back to Paul's day as he speaks to the synagogue. Paul is saying a work is being done in their day as well. For their generation. It was in their generation that Jesus Christ came and died and rose again. The Messiah has come and his own people put him to death. But God raised him, and it's only through him that they can find forgiveness. So Paul says to them, he says, Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophet should come about. 
he repeats the same idea from Habakkuk, that in Habakkuk's day, it was hard to believe, but they should believe it. And Paul is saying the same thing to the synagogue. I know this is hard to believe. Believe it. You need this forgiveness. Well, God does not have to give warnings. This is a grace from the Lord. He did not have to give this warning in Habakkuk's day. He could have just taken them by surprise and accomplished his purposes and brought this nation against them. Instead, he gave warning after warning after warning to the faithful who would hear it. Well, Paul did not have to give this warning to his audience. And yet God wants them to be warned to know that this man, Christ Jesus, is their only option. This one who died and was buried and who rose again, he's their only option. He's the only way. It's not through the law of Moses. The only way to find this forgiveness is through this man. Paul gives this clear warning to them. Even if it's hard to stomach, it's true. And again, the same goes for you if you're an unbeliever. If you've never come to the Lord for the forgiveness of your sin, uh, sometimes it can feel like rottenness in our bones to hear that we are sinners and that we deserve hell. It feels like rottenness to hear that we're sinners and we deserve condemnation. It feels like rottenness to accept that there is nothing we can do in our own power to fix that situation. We don't like that part of the message. I understand that that can feel like rottenness, but beware, to use Paul's word. Just because something feels hard to accept doesn't mean it's not true. And it is true. And what Paul is offering them is the only way to salvation, and it's the only way to salvation for you. Come to the Lord Jesus. And when you do, that rottenness goes away. He's paid. The trial can be over. The verdict reached innocent forever because of what Christ has done on your behalf. You need that. You need your sins to be erased. Believers, you still can have this tendency, like I do, to ignore God's word. We need this warning from the prophets as well, right? We can still read from the prophets and the apostles and just assume we know better or just assume that we can skip over this part because we don't want to accept it. We've already formed our understanding what we think is true, so we're not going to let the word of God challenge it. We've got to beware, to use Paul's word again, that we're never doing that, that we're always letting the word of God challenge us, wrecking even our most cherished beliefs if they don't line up with Scripture. Well, we've seen a lot today in our passage, and I know it was a lot. I know that we were juggling four different generations, right? You've got David's day, you've got the people hearing in Isaiah's day, you've got Paul's day, and you've got our day thinking back about all of these promises. Uh, We're also sorting through four different Old Testament passages. You've got the one from Psalm 2 and Isaiah 55 and Psalm 16 and then Habakkuk. So I know it was a bunch to sort through today. But I think you can clearly see what Paul is saying to the synagogue, that he has laid a foundation that this is what God is like, and it is consistent with this gospel message. And here is this gospel message. Here are the facts of first importance of the gospel. Now believe it. This is something God revealed to the fathers, and now it has come to pass. Believe it, that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, and you can find forgiveness of sins. It's such a clear and compelling message to these men in the synagogues. God gave careful promises to the Father, to the fathers. He did not have to activate a plan B when Jesus came. He had already told it beforehand, and he knew exactly what he was saying. And all of his promises are careful promises. So we can be amazed at God's faithfulness. We can be amazed at his careful, true words through the prophets. We can be amazed at the resurrection. We can be amazed that God so freely forgives us, even though we don't deserve it. And while we're amazed, we can remember God's careful promises to us that he forgives all those who confess and come to him. That he's only allowed temptations and trials in our life that are common to man. That he provides all that we need physically, spiritually, Anything we need, the Lord has provided. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you'd help us remember 
your promises. Remember that you were careful in your word, and your word stands forever. Help us remember that you accomplish through your word what you said you would accomplish. That you bring things about in human history and that you work in our hearts. That you are the sovereign one who knows all things, including the future. And you're careful when you make promises. Help us believe. Help us trust in every way. Help us think through and understand how Paul is quoting these scriptures. Help us have a firm understanding of the Old Testament so that we can have this firm understanding of what Paul is saying here, a firm understanding about the gospel, a firm understanding of who you are and and how you've acted in human history. Help us wrestle with these things. We thank you, Father, uh, for the liberating forgiveness that we have in Christ. We thank you that though there are things that we can never be freed from through the law of Moses, we thank you that we have been freed in Jesus Christ. We pray that you'd help us cherish that truth, help us cherish these gifts, your promises the resurrection of Jesus, the forgiveness that we have. Help us cherish that you have given these things to us and give you honor and praise and glory and worship you as you deserve. Help us heed your warnings, come to you. In Jesus' name, amen.